Edwin Alamany's fate was sealed this morning, a day after being convicted for the murder of 24-year-old Amy Lord and assaulting two other women back in 2013. Edwin J. Alamany is to offense 001, murder in the first degree. Sir, you hereby sentenced to the Mass Correctional Institution at Cedar Junction for and during the term of your natural life. It took the jury about a day to find Alamany guilty. His lawyer argued he was, quote, hapless, helpless, and hopeless, and not criminally responsible for the crime. Joining me now is the man who tried to make that case, Jeffrey Denner. Jeffrey, it's good to see you. <clears throat> good to see you, Jeffrey. You go in knowing the insanity defense, the odds are virtually non-existent. Give us the short version of the case you made to the jury. Yeah, the, sh <clears throat> the short version is that Edwin Alamany was a sick boy who, as he got older, turned into a very sick man. He was literally, figuratively, and legally insane. Uh, but unfortunately, in the context of this world that we live in, he, he was such a dangerous man, the crimes were so horrific, that even though it was clear to everybody that he was insane, clear to everybody that he was one of the sickest people they'd met, if they had acknowledged that legally, they would have had to find him not guilty by reason of insanity. He could have been out in as little as six months and certainly within a couple of years. And there is, you can't ask a jury to make that kind of decision. I want to get back to the jury in a second, but the, obviously you say everybody agreed. The prosecution did, and their contention was essentially that the carefully uh, uh, put together, what was it, 18 hours or whatever it is, is not the sign of a man who is so mentally ill that he doesn't understand the consequences of his acts, no? The fact is that, that no one agreed other than the people who didn't have a vested interest in this. If you took a good look at what happened, if you took, we didn't create him out of whole cloth. He, he is somebody from age 13 on had a wide variety of psychotic diagnoses from really, from really good hospitals, really good doctors who had no agenda. People who would look at him, who spent huge amounts of time with him, who medicated him with very powerful anti-psychotic medications, antidepressants, mood stabilizers, the, the whole cocktail of psychoactive meds, and they couldn't control his behavior. And, and that's who he was, and that's who he was when he was 18, when he aged out, and, and all these treatments and resources were no longer available to him, and he deteriorated dramatically after that. So your assessment, even though you don't know for a fact, your assessment is the jury probably bought that concept, but the notion, saying the words not guilty, followed by, uh, by reason of insanity, and the potential he could get out, not realistically in six months, but at some point in the future, is, as you said, just asking too much of a jury? I think that's a big part of it. I think if you had something that's now being discussed, as we both know, that perhaps was called it guilty but insane, and people went away for a minimum of 10 years, 20 years, but went to hospitals, got treated, I think people would be a lot more likely to do it. The second piece of this, apart from asking them to, that they're asking them too much, is the notion, the emotion in a case like this. It's so difficult, apart from being afraid to let someone go, to separate yourself from seeing a parent up there, a sister, a brother, talking about the, 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 the consequences, the implications of, of losing this loved one. Do you go to the prosecution in a case like this beforehand and say what you just said to me and what you said to the jury, this guy is so out of it, you're not in any way minimizing the horrific nature of what he did. Do you even bother or is it just a useless uh, he, the, the prosecutors in this particular case were terrific prosecutors, incredibly bright, able guys. But their mindset, their perspective, and, and, you know, and it's theirs, and I have my perspective. One is not necessarily better than the other, but they're very different. There was no line of communication. So why does it ever, Andrew Yates, high-profile cases, John Hinckley, in Massachusetts, fewer than 20 times in the last decade has this uh, insanity defense worked. Why does it ever work? I mean, because I'm assuming in the mind of a jury, even if they're convinced that a lawyer like you is making a credible case, they don't want to do what you said they don't want to do. Well, I, I think on some level, they knew it was a credible case. They were able to come back in about 45 minutes. And the fact that they deliberated over two days and so forth suggests that, that there was something that, that resonated with them. But the fear of, of uh, that they are setting up fellow citizens themselves anyone for this ever to be repeated is just too great. Jeffrey Denner, by your definition, I understand this is not how you strategically approach cases, don't you believe that a huge percentage of, of your clients who do absolutely unthinkable things are probably mentally not capable at the time of the crime? I think there's a level of psychopathology that, that exists kind of across the board in crime. But the legal, the legal requisites for insanity truly not having the capacity to appreciate wrongfulness, not having the capacity to conform your behavior is a lot rarer. It simply is. That's, 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 that's a much higher bar to get over. We only have 30 seconds left. The vast majority of people don't care what happens to Alamany, but does he get any treatment 
for the rest of his life, or is he essentially warehoused? For He's the rest? warehoused, but I think a lot of people do care. But I think they they're hoping something bad is going to happen to him. Jeffrey Denner, thank you so much for your time. No, it's a tough day.